Well, what if everything you know about the flights on 9-11 that morning, that tragic morning, is a total lie, a total fabrication? Our next guest is a veteran commercial pilot, flight instructor with Britain Norman Aircraft Corporation, and a researcher with the International Center for 9-11 Justice. He's done an in-depth study of the reported flight paths on that day performed by the so-called hijackers, who allegedly took over these flights on 9-11, and he's here to share his findings with us today. Our guest is Olivier Karen Mason. Olivier, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for your research. Clayton, thank you very much indeed. And uh, let me take this opportunity again to commend you on the fantastic work that you, Natalie, and your team do on Redacted. You approach, you approach you know, extremely sensitive subjects. Uh, we're in troubling times, and uh, the your everything that you do to expose these your contribution is just outstanding so i'm a fan of your channel oh thank you so much very kind of you to say you know i think the thing that we gravitate to towards you know the stories on this show that we gravitate towards are those stories that are redacted or there's a narrative that the government wants us to believe whether it's about an assassination attempt and they tell us a, a you know particular story they try to spoon feed it to us um, and we're supposed to swallow it. And I think for many, many years, Americans were forced to swallow through the 9-11 Commission report this idea that these Muslim hijackers somehow with no flight experience managed to take over these aircraft and with precision guide them into the Twin Towers and into the Pentagon. And as many advanced pilots have come out and said, these advanced pilots have said, we would never be able to to pull off these maneuvers. These guys with no flight experience managed to pull off these maneuvers? It sounds absurd. So you've given your your life in many ways to cracking this nut and going down this rabbit hole. What was the moment for you that you said, this stinks, this makes absolutely no sense, and you wanted to learn more about it? It started really um, on the day of 9-11. Uh, I was uh, I had just turned 42. I was out of aviation at that time for other reasons. Um, but when I saw uh, the just the feat of being able to bring the 767, two 767 to the towers and the conditions in which was done, uh, you know, like so many people, my blood froze and, um, you know, the lights went on, especially when the, the towers then imploded. For instance, in uh, a few years before in Madrid, there were raging fire, fires in um, skyscrapers. Uh, that lasted for weeks, um, and then so, uh, but the twin towers who were built to withstand the impact of the seven hundred seven suddenly crumbled. So that was the, that's when it started. So when you started looking at the data, you know we've talked about pilots on the show before. We've had Captain Dan Hanley on the show talking about uh, the pilots. He really focuses on sort of the last moments here, the the maneuvers at the you know right into the towers. But you started analyzing the data from the flight paths and from the beginning. Can you walk us through what your data suggests and what you started started uh, peeling back from the NTSB, from the flight records, all of those things? Can you kind of give us an overview and then we'll dive into the specifics? Sure, absolutely. Uh, our, my primary research focused on evaluating the hypothesis that these alleged hijackers could not have successfully carried out and controlled the aircraft uh, given their level of training. So we decided to analyze the official narrative based on a forensic examination of the flight profiles. And we sourced this from the NTSB reports, uh, which uh, I've uh, forwarded on to you and which we'll refer to. And boy, what a surprise that was. So uh, we conducted a detailed analysis on the, uh, flight, the key maneuvers, the operational challenges. And what was interesting to do was indeed, as you referred to, was to um, see, evaluate the level of proficiency that would be required for an airline pilot, Boeing type rated, to achieve these maneuvers, control the aircraft in the manner in which they were. And on the other hand, by contrast, what, how would an inexperienced pilot, uh, you know, manage this? That's how we approached it. So what did you see in the, what was the first jaw dropping moment for you? when you started analyzing what was out there publicly. Actually, maybe we should start with what is the public what is the public narrative? What have they told us? What is in the 9/11 Commission report that we are supposed to believe about that day? Let's start there and then let's get into what was sort of a jaw-dropping moment for you and the first piece of data that said, "Whoa, this is this is a total lie." 
yeah, well, the first incoherence, uh, and I'm speaking as a flight instructor, is to make uh, one believe that uh, the leap from a twin piston aircraft on which they had minimal training to a Boeing 767-200 cockpit was just a, a, an easy transition and that they would be able to adapt and, and correlate what they had learned from one into the other. Now that's, that's absolutely impossible. Uh, you need hours and hours of flight training on a simulator. Uh, as far as we know, they had limited or no limited flight training. There was some indication of um, some Boeing 727 training from a legacy Pan Am flight school. I can't remember in which state, but certainly no 767 training. And the jaw-dropping moment came when I looked at the flight profile, uh, the pressure altitude radar mode C returns of United 175, which showed an incredibly steep descent uh, in the last few minutes, which was fr frankly uncontrollable. Um, let alone the fact that um, they managed to neutralize the flight crew. I mean, I don't know whether you remember, but um, the Captain Victor Serrac Serracini, who was a former naval aviator of the United States Navy, and his first officer was also an ex-military uh, officer, Michael Horrocks, um, were neutralized. Now, how they were neutralized, we don't know. Were they coerced because they threatened to uh, kill one of the flight, flight attendants or one of the passengers? But let me say this, it really is not in the ethos of pilots to hand over an aircraft to potential hijackers so easily. So, you know, already from the outset, there are many incoherences that um, you know, are head scratches. So the crew is neutralized this what do we let's talk about now some of the specific data so you're looking at this yeah. altitude report the pressure altitude return from the radar what are we seeing here as we look at this on the screen now this is a flight path study uh, dated february 19 2002 by a certain jim ritter who is the chief of the vehicle performance division at the ntsb and the radar mode c returns are the altitude returns from the onboard transponder, which is giving and recording and, and transmitting the altitudes as the flight progresses. So uh, just to quickly take you through the first the first steps, it takes off from Logan International at 8.14. Uh, some 18 minutes later, um, it's uh, 28, 28 minutes later, beg your pardon, it was the last communication with ATC, air traffic control. And at 8.47 uh, is the assumed takeover time at which uh, the hijackers supposedly took over the 767 now how did they how did their base how did they excuse me base their assumptions well somebody tweaked the transponder and there were two different transponder codes that suddenly arose out of nowhere but that's not necessarily an indication of a uh, of a takeover now a few minutes later uh, uh, you will see on the on the graph at point F, there's a sudden climb to some 34,000 feet in two minutes. Um, were they uh, inadvertently or mismanaging the um, autopilot that we don't know? Had they uh, switched uh, the autopilot off that we don't know? It's pure speculation, so I can't really address the, uh, anything other than the fact that the plane climbed. But then, it uh, entered into a really uneven descent. Um, it started at about two and a half thousand feet per minute, which is about twice, well over twice the usual uh, speed at, um, at which an aircraft descends. And then it, uh, there's a sudden jolt at uh, 275, and then it, uh, it re then it starts entering a very severe descent at point G of some 4,000 feet per minute, and then the, an accelerating descent all the way down to the, uh, to the ground uh, at 9.02.59. And you'll see this big red down arrow to the right, which I've placed in this graph. And just let's keep that in mind for, uh, for what I will be saying in a few minutes about this, uh, this event. So that's more or less the, the profile for this, for this flight. 
Um, I can, if you want, uh, do you have a question now? Otherwise I can go on next graph. Um, no, please. Yeah. Show me the next graphic here. So this flight, I'm just, you know, curious here. So we don't know what happened between point F and the top there at 33,000 feet. Then suddenly it starts this dramatic descent. Just so I understand as a pilot, I mean, that type of descent, would you be able to have control of the craft? If you're a human being, would you have normal total control? You'd be able to fly it like you're you know, like your Maverick, you'd be fine to be able to pull this off? Or is this a, is this a highly advanced maneuver to even have any kind of control of the craft at that point? It's a, it's a highly advanced maneuver. Uh, pilots, commercial pilots uh, in simulator train for extreme descents in the characterization or a kind of emergency. Um, but what is also notable uh, is the fact that uh, these kinds of descents put extreme pressure on the cabin's pressurization system, which is usually tweaked to allow for a gradual uh, descent of about 50 to 1,000 feet per minute uh, in order to keep the passengers uh, comfortable. Now here we've gone from a, a increasing from a, a descent which is already twice the normal speed of descent uh, to about six times the normal speed of descent. Now this puts serious strains on the occupant craft. Um, anything from ear nosebleeds, hyperventilation, disorientation, that's physical. And I'm not even talking about the psychological stresses of a plane in a nosedive. Would the alleged hijackers uh, have had the presence of mind to grab an oxygen mask just before that so that they, they, they were, were, did not experience any hypoxia uh, during this in order to keep controlling the aircraft. No, I mean, it's um, it, it's something that needs many hours of practice in a, in a, in a Boeing simulator in order to, to not, not only control the aircraft, but to get out of it. And we'll get back to that in a second. Okay, fascinating. So really, this would be an absolutely advanced maneuver unprecedented it would cause disorientation nosebleeds hypoxia all sorts of other physical problems to a human being and they would have to have the wherewithal to grab oxygen masks put oxygen masks on and as you point out they would have to that type of training would take place hundreds of hours in simulators in order to make sure that you're safe and protected and know what to do in those types of situations okay got that all right let's move on to this next graphic here what are we seeing in this next one now this next one, uh, the parameters calculated from the airport surveillance radar at New York International, and this was published on February 2nd, 2002 by Daniel Bauer, who's a chief aerospace engineer. He was the one who plugged this report out. And this is uh, very useful also because you have uh, four bars, four horizontal bars, the first one showing altitude, the next one, the ground speed, and the bottom one, the magnetic heading. So we know a little more about what kind of attitude the aircraft was in and what flight profile it was in. But very briefly, and uh, it, it looks quite gradual and the slope looks quite gentle, but in fact, uh, we're looking only at two minutes and two minutes and 10 seconds of flight time. Uh, you'll see that at 9.01, <clears throat> the aircraft was at 1,500 feet. And one minute later, it, it had descended to 6,000 feet. And then it continued its descent all the way to 902.40. We have the last 10 seconds of recorded data between 902.30 and 902.40, uh, time at which it, keep, it keeps accel accelerating. The ground speed augments, increases significantly from 450 knots to 520 knots. And whilst they're kind of trying to control this uh, downward trajectory, nosedive, and uh, you know, monitor the instruments to see if everything is coordinated. They also enter a turn, which also compounds the difficulty of the maneuver. So that's that was very useful uh, to determine what uh, attitude the plane was in and what situation they were supposed to come out of uh, at the end of this at nine o two forty. What do you make of this when you when you examine this data? What stands out to you the most? What do you think is the most well, glaring? The, 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 there are three things to, to, that are noteworthy here. One, the last 10 seconds of recorded data, um, which is in fact 19 seconds before impact. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, interesting video footage. Now let me say this uh, quickly, briefly. In these last 
10 seconds of recorded data between 902.30 and 902.40, the aircraft is still in an extreme descent rate, 6,000 plus feet per minute. I mean, it, you know, it is drastic, uh, let alone the experience on board. Um, they make the, the plane would have, the aircraft would have been in flight idle. That means uh, the engines would not be providing any thrust because otherwise they would be uh, for fear of overspeeding and reaching the speed of sound and the plane would disintegrate. Um, bearing in mind also, uh, as, as we see from the video footage, which I'll come to in a second, the plane must have put on full power again at one point in order to accelerate and uh, crash into the tower. Now, this Boeing 767-200 had Pratt & Whitney uh, PW4000 turbines, and they take a spool up time of between five and eight seconds to uh, provide full thrust from the moment at which you engage the levers into full thrust mode. At this stage, it's inconceivable that they would have been using the autopilot in any way because the reaction times and, and the guesstimates that one would have to make as to what the proper inputs would have been necessary is totally just uh, impossible. So here we're faced with a, a huge inconsistency. This is a jaw dropper between the two reports because remember the big arrow in the first graph which I showed and the last recorded uh, 10 seconds in this. They both show that at 9.02.40, the aircraft is plunging. So when did it level off from this uh, dive? When uh, did they decide to uh, control the aircraft to put it in, a, in, a, in an attitude, enabling it to go and hit the towers? Now, uh, there is some really vital footage was provided by the MSNBC choppers who were filming the events of 9-11. And uh, this I, I showed in the symposium of, uh, of a few hours ago, uh, which recorded the last 12 seconds of the flight path of the 767-200, the opening United 175. And the plane, uh, 12 seconds out, is in a very gradual descent, uh, descending maybe to one, 200 feet per minute, no more. And in the last four seconds, it's practically parallel to the ground before it hits the South Tower. So uh, we, the last recorded data gives 19 seconds to the impact. The uh, NBC, uh, MSNBC footage gives 12 minutes of recorded uh, video footage, which shows what the plane is actually uh, doing and what seconds. attitude it's in. And so it leaves a seven second gap. Well, in the seven second gap, there is absolutely no way that even an, an experienced, highly trained uh, Boeing 767 captain could easily control a plane out of a nosedive of 6,000 feet per minute plus, uh, straighten it, and, and, and then uh, steer uh, and put it on a level flight path uh, to the tower. So what do you make of that then? We have the footage from MSNBC, but we have this this flight record, these this, these data points from, from Newark, how, what are you saying then? In that seven seconds, it never pulled out of that nosedive? It was never parallel? Or, well, or well, it clearly was? It did. What, the, I'm saying, what, what I'm right. saying is we have to trust our eyes is that what we saw was what happened. But both NTSB reports don't show a leveling off period. They show a straight, uh, a, a straight uh, dive into the ground. There's the, now, especially the first uh, graph which you showed, which is the uh, pressure altitude from the radar mode C returns, uh, there's absolutely no, no transition from the dive into a leveling off uh, transition. So, so that what do you the make question. of that? What Exactly. Yeah. Well, what, what, so I can't. I can't trust the published data uh, uh, up to a point. Up to a point because it, it's inconsistent with the with the video footage. Um, so leaving aside the fact that the data is skewed or unreliable, it begs the question as to who was controlling the aircraft. Now, you see, the data in itself uh, highlights the challenges in determining the exact control methods which were used by the uh, alleged, you know, inexperienced hijackers, inexperienced pilots, given their limitations. And the, so, uh, um, you know, the capabilities of both human and automated systems, autopilot and autothrottle, uh, wouldn't have been able 
to control and steer and maneuver the aircraft in, in, in what is shown. And the uh, near impossibility to, the impossibility of Mahawan Narchehi achieving such control maneuvers along points towards the likely involvement of advanced automated systems, possibly with some human oversight or intervention, because what, what is evident is the manual inputs or for the autopilot or, or the manual controls uh, under, again, the control of a pilot with limited experience just wouldn't suffice, wouldn't be enough. So very it's troubling. your contention very then. Chilling. Yeah, it is very chilling. And I mean, do you believe then that this data is totally false? If, if, if we can't trust the last few seconds of the data because it doesn't show any leveling off at all, then do you want to throw out all of the data from the NTSB? Well, it's inconsistent in itself. The first one, the, the, the transponder returns uh, go all the way to the ground to just under a thousand feet. I think it, uh, it hits the South Tower at about 800 feet. That's between the 75th and the 88th floor. I can't remember exactly. So that one goes all the way to the end. Conveniently, for, for the uh, Newark uh, uh, radar returns only stop at 90240. So we have a gap of 19 seconds, uh, which are unaccounted for. Uh, mm. uh, and unexplained, and no, no further information has been provided there. But so it's convenient. Really it's convenient, right? It, it is absolutely convenient yes. that that so suddenly video, stops. The video footage is key. The video footage is key in that because it provides twelve seconds of report of you know reports of the last twelve seconds, and we see visually the flight attitude in which the plane was, leaving this gap of, of seven seconds, which is just too too short now to to do anything now. Miraculously, maybe uh, maybe uh, uh, you know a very well trained um, airline transport pilot could do this. Uh, 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 you know, this motley crew of uh, alleged hijackers could they could they do that? No, no way. In my mind, no way. And I think we've confirmed that now on the show, not only with your your great research, but others that there's absolutely no way these guys could have piloted these craft with such precision that even advanced pilots, like I say, I jokingly say Maverick, couldn't would have struggled to even pull off, would not have happened. So then what do you think actually did happen? Do you believe it was remotely controlled with these advanced systems, which we've also shown here on the show were well in place? They These remote piloting yeah. pro, uh, systems were built after World War II, um, yeah, or it might have even been used during World War II, if I'm not mistaken. So these, this was well known and well documented. It was top secret, of course, um, but we knew we know that these remote uh, remote control systems were in place since around World War II. Um, is it your contention then that these were remotely controlled into these buildings and into the Pentagon? There, there are a couple of possibilities that they were remotely controlled, which is uh, you know a technology that's available, been tried and tested. It's also possible that there'd been onboard programming in the software. I mean, if uh, we go back to the uh, early seventies, uh, the then British European Airways had Trident jets uh, that could land automatically uh, in zero visibility because the already the uh, technology and the flight systems enabled that uh, uh, to happen. So, you know, uh, was it one, was it, was it the other, was it a combination of both? Uh, that's almost irrelevant, but certainly uh, what, uh, what it points to is the fact that uh, the, they just didn't have the level of proficiency in order to achieve these maneuvers for, for 175. We haven't really talked about the Pentagon here, but I don't know if your data takes you to the Pentagon um, and what you see with that flight path and the inconsistencies there. Do you want to talk about that? Well, um, I'm actually currently working on uh, writing, finalizing a paper on uh, on the Pentagon flight. So I won't advance uh, anything at this stage, but I'm very happy to at a later stage. The the other one that I we presented in the uh, symposium was United 93. Uh, if you want me to say a few words on that, sure. it's, it's very much... It's very much the odd one out because its profile doesn't conform to that of the other flight profiles of the other three hijackings. Um, for instance, um, the assumed takeover time, again assumed, uh, is um, some 46 minutes after takeoff. That's uh, around 8.42. 
whereas all the other flights were taken were taken over allegedly between 15 and 30 minutes after takeoff. So with every passing minute, given that you're traveling, at, you know, uh, uh, you're covering a distance of about eight miles per minute, you know, you're increasing your navigational challenges, your, uh, your distance is increasing to potential targets as the time goes by. And there's also a very strange thing about uh, 93, United 93. Um, the flight data recorder was recovered. Um, there were voice recordings, which only start at 9.31. Uh, why, uh, you know, almost an hour into the flight, did they decide to provide um, the details of the uh, cockpit voice recordings? Uh, another very, very strange uh, occurrence in uh, United 93 is the total absence of rationale for descending suddenly to 5,000 feet, as you'll see in um, the graph which I provided, there's a very steep descent uh, to 5,000 feet because, uh, you know, as, uh, with every minute that passes by, you know you're getting further and further away from a potential target. You need altitude. Altitude is your friend at these instances for visual references if you're going to go and hit something. Uh, you, you you need to get some sense of situational awareness when you take over an aircraft. You know where where am I? How high am I? What, where do I need to turn to? They would have had no ideas as to the vectors that ATC would have assigned or the or the, what was programmed into you know to the autopilot. So um, the, the 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 plane suddenly descends to five thousand feet and you're risking collision from um, uh, you know other commercial jets which are flying around you're risking collision at that altitude from uh, uh, you know general aviation um so you know, and then and you don't see much i mean you have absolutely no visual reference to, to know where you're going so what was the point of descending to 5000 that was a, a very odd one uh, amongst the oddities um and I'll, I'll leave it at that and i know ted has uh, spoken about this at length in in the symposium is the uh, the, the weird phone calls you have uh, around 9.50, 10 minutes before the crash, um, uh, Sandra Bradshaw, who's a flight attendant, who's speaking to her husband, Philip Bradshaw, and saying that the hijackers are in front of the plane, and she was still assuming that pilots were still in control. So all these inconsistencies and incoherences give the impression that this flight was an exercise in simulating a hijacking. Um, there's not, you know, it's... Uh, it's very, very troubling again. Yeah, it's deeply disturbing. And of course, we've been told that this is the official story, that yeah. some brave Americans got up, ran to the front of Flight 93 and, and said, let's go, right? Let's move, right? Was the, I think the, maybe I have the name of the, the book wrong. But this idea that a brave American stopped it from turning around and heading towards the White House or Capitol Hill, yeah. or some place yeah. in Washington, D.C., and these brave Americans stopped it from happening. What do you think ultimately brought down the craft? Um, again, um, this is pure speculation on my part, but uh, I, this plane wasn't, was, I think, uh, destined to crash because, as you said quite correctly, it was for the kudos, for the gravitas of the occasion, and uh, to give this feel-good factor to the population in this propaganda-driven, you know, narrative about the, the events of 9-11. And uh, this would just reinforce uh, the, you know, the, the narrative and the, the effects and perceptions that the those in control wanted to provide the population. So it was, I think it was destined to crash. Hmm. Destined to crash in that field in Pennsylvania where there a farm, no one around really, um, and uh, kind of in an isolated area, so it didn't hit a city. But then you could use this as a story, as a narrative, that Americans stopped these hijackers from turning it back to the capital. It was a rallying That's cry right. for the United States. Exactly. Propaganda. Cry, indeed. Propaganda is very, very strong. And uh, I think when you start to peel back the, the, the layer of this of what happened that day, whether it's Building 7 or the, la the the fact that these pilots could never have piloted these planes with this precision, uh, how all of these men were able to get on flights and not one member of security screening flagged box cutters, not one member pointed out the box cutters going through security screening, like all of this stuff 
absolutely smells of a cover up and uh, and to and why you know at the end of the day why right I always ask the well it's Occam's razor it's the yeah. fastest most the yeah. strongest way to bring us into permanent war on terror to make the massive military industrial complex as large as it is now um, and to take over and destabilize countries throughout the Middle East um, and uh, you know and keep us in these forever wars and that's Indeed. the most deeply disturbing part of this um so when people ask why do you cover this story well how thousands of americans died that day and people from around the world used as pawns in this sort of globalist chess chessboard um yeah anything else you want to kind of say here olivier before we wrap it up any sort of final points you want to you want to point out that maybe we didn't cover well, no, we covered everything. I mean, uh, as you said, you know, quite quite correctly, it leaves, uh, uh, you know, a number of unanswered questions. How could uh, inex inexperienced pilots perform such complex maneuvers? And, you know, we, we here we are calmly talking about these things or looking at graphs and, you know, examining, it, examining them and calculating. But in real life, imagine the high stress conditions under which this was conducted. I mean, imagine the, the screaming passengers, uh, the the, the physical, uh, you know, symptoms appearing in these in these descents. So, you know, how were they able to manage and control all this? The other unanswered question is why the extreme divergence between the both and TSB reports and the video footage. That you know, that's a that's a, that's a big question. Uh, as far as uh, United 175, um, how could they, you know, control the aircraft effectively towards the target with so little situational awareness 10 miles out because 10 miles out they were one minute away from the south tower and they were still descending at 6,000 feet per minute one you know uh, one minute away and also what has not been brought to anyone's attention is the fact that it was a severely bright day beautiful day there was much sun glare uh, coming at about 76 degrees from the aircraft's cockpit, which would have, you know, made reading or reflections quite intense inside the cockpit. But and it, be, be that as it may, uh, you know, uh, 10 miles out, one minute to go, um, they, they just couldn't have pulled it off. As far as United 93 is why, what or who caused the descent to 5,000 feet? I mean, the, we don't have any... Uh, explanation by the 9-11 Commission report that uh, va that validates the rationale behind that. So, and the fifth question, and you know, final unanswered question is: uh, Were there any external factors or interventions that could explain the behavior of these aircrafts in these critical moments? And that's my final big question. Hmm. And I hope maybe we can hear from some additional whistleblowers who may have had some involvement and knowledge about this. I think. Um, you know, this is a, an important piece of the puzzle here. Uh, the remote controlling of these aircraft, um, whether it's an NTSB whistleblower that knows that there was data that was manipulated on that day. There's still so many pieces that we can put together here on this story. Olivier, thank you so much for your great work on this. We're looking forward to the Pentagon piece of this, and we hope you'll come back once the Pentagon piece is done. Maybe we can do a deep dive on that as well. With pleasure, Clayton. Many thanks for uh, your invitation. Thank you.